Hi, this is Steve Lee Andrews, Outlaw Bookseller. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, please subscribe. This is the first in a series of videos I'm going to be doing on and off over the next year or so, or years to come. We'll see how long it takes. Based on my book, 100 Must Read Books for Men, which I co-wrote back in 2007 with my good friend Duncan Boas. Even before I'd finished writing 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels, my editor Jenny at ANC Black asked me, what would you do next? Because of course, the thing to do in publishing if you want to be successful is once you've done one successful book, you kind of repeat the experiment but in a different way. And publishers really like that if you sort of work within an established formula and you know, people like that formula and what have you. Of course, there are writers who completely ignore that, like Jeff Dyer, um, um, who, you know, is very good. And, you know, those are the real writers. Rupert Thompson is possibly another one. And I had to think about it and I thought I'd like to write about all sorts of books which I really love of different kinds of fiction and non-fiction. Books which weren't genre fiction and yet reflected my taste and they were books I really loved. But I couldn't think of a way to bring them all together and I was at work one day and it suddenly struck me that a lot of those books I would recommend to people and some of them would really strike a chord with men, but they would really strike a chord with women, though of course there were notable exceptions. This is a general thing rather than a specific one. So I thought about what would go in the book and what it would be called. And I rang my editor from my office and I said, how does this sound? 100 must read books for men. And scarcely a beat passed before she said, let's do it. I'd also thought there could be a companion volume, 100 Must Read Books for Women, and I thought of somebody who I knew would write a really, really good book like that. But when Jenny and I discussed it, she said no. She said women are already covered really, really well in, in books and the book world and what have you. And she was, of course, absolutely right. And I brought on board my friend Duncan Bowis to help write this because he is a really good writer and he has a facility with sports, which doesn't interest me at all. So I brought Duncan on board for this and I wrote about 70% of it and he wrote about 30% of it because Duncan is well read and he's a good writer so I want his input as well to get it broader because he's also a family man and I'm not. So we went ahead with this and obviously in the meantime 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels came out and was quite successful, reprinted several times and we forged forward with this. Now I'm doing this lengthy preamble before I talk about today's choice because I want to raise an issue which is little discussed in the world of books. Somehow, as soon as you start talking about books for men or men's writing or writing aimed at men, immediately it seems to be misinterpreted as some sort of misogyny. It isn't. What I can tell you after 38 years of working in the book trade is the book trade is an incredibly feminized industry. Most people you work with will be women. Most people who work at publishers are women. If you look at the book trade press, which now is pretty much reduced to the bookseller, if you look at the photographs of authors, publishers all the way through, you will find that most of them are women, and this has gone on for years and years and years. And if you look at publishers' catalogues, which are tweaked and sent out to bookshops, they will feature more women than men. There will be quotations from booksellers who've read proofs, and they will mostly be women, and so on. Now, I've no problem with this at all, except that, if we're in a world where we talk about diversity, we need to be fundamental and look at the fact that 50% of the world's people are men. Men are badly served by the book industry in Britain. People don't know how to market books to them. They only know how to market sort of Lee Child type thrillers or military history. They don't know how to market literature and they don't know how to market the kind of genre fiction that appeals to men. So my plan with this book really was to write about books which I loved, which I felt had a core that would appeal to men based on my experience of recommending them, feedback from readers I'd recommended them to, based on my and Duncan's experiences as men who read, wrote and sold books, because Duncan used to be a bookseller as well, he's a teacher now. And the book, before it was even published, it was announced six months before it was published and it was up for pre-order on sites like Amazon. And almost instantly, a rip-off website appeared with exactly the same title. How original. Now, as this was part of a series, something we decided in this series with the series editor, Nick Renison, who co-authored the SF book with me, was that 
basically we wouldn't repeat anything. If a book appeared in one of these, it wouldn't appear in others. So they were obvious omissions. Like for example, there's no Jack Kerouac book in this because it had already been covered, probably in a book which Nick wrote called 100 Must Read American Novels, which I um, helped him push at ANC Black because they weren't convinced by it. And I said to them, look, you know, American fiction is really, really popular. And there are people who want American fiction recommendations, so let's go for it. Anyway, so we decided that, you know, there would be things in here which weren't in other volumes. So, of course, the website had a lot more predictable stuff. And some of the feedback we had on this was, why didn't you have this? Why didn't you have that? But, you know, why preach to the converted? Let's have something new. And the book came out and it came out serendipitously at the same time as an author called Tim Lott published in a newspaper or magazine a piece about the sexism of the Orange Prize for Fiction, now called the Women's Prize for Fiction. Um, the Orange Prize was at that time the largest literary prize in Britain. I think it was £30,000. It was bigger than the Booker. The Booker lifted their prize money to match it. And basically, it's always been exclusive to women. You could only be shortlisted. You could only, if you're a publisher, you could only submit books to it if they were by female author. Now, I have no problem with exclusivity because exclusivity um, emphasizes difference and difference is the same word as diversity. It's the same root. You have to allow difference and exclusivity if you want diversity. You have to allow people to be different. This is a paradox with inclusivity. You can't be inclusive and diverse, not really. You can allow all sorts of things, but only if you allow exclusivity. You can only be inclusive and diverse by allowing a level of exclusivity. Tim Lott seemed to take umbrage with it. And I think he was just sort of trying to make a point really to, similar to what we were making in this, that you know men were, were badly served in the British book industry because the vast majority of people working in it were women. The argument used to be that all the powerful people in the book trade were men. And this simply wasn't true. There were loads and loads of women um, at the heads of publishers and what have you. And, you know, things changed a lot in the 70s and 80s. And there were loads of really powerful women publishing. Every single person I worked with, with my three books at ANC Black was a woman. They were all fantastic. They were all unbiased. They didn't have this issue that, you know, as soon as you wrote a book like this, it was misogyny. And, you know, they displayed none of the misandry, it's a word you don't hear very often, that, you know, is common as soon as a man asserts himself in the world of books. It was an interesting experience because what we did, we took advantage of Tim Lott's piece and we had a little press release that went out with copies of the book to papers and what have you saying that, you know, two booksellers have taken the challenge and they're going to talk about why, you know, books for men need to be highlighted and why it's important. I pointed out in the release that I didn't really agree with Tim, that I have, had no problem with exclusivity as long as it swung both ways. So if you can have a table in a bookshop with women's writing, then what's wrong with having one with men's writing? It's the same thing. I was offered an interview on Open Book, Radio 4, the biggest book program in the UK. And it was then fronted by a lady who is still very prevalent in the media today. And I was invited on the program and I was interviewed and I think it was on a Friday and it was in London at the BBC White Building, the one that, you know, the Ministry of Love in 1984 was based on, where all well worked. And also in the program, Alan Silito was on it. Um, I saw him briefly in the um, foyer and the interview was recorded and it was much longer than what was broadcasted, it was edited. And I have to say that the host and her guest, who was another popular media figure at that point, um, did everything they could to pillory me and to pillory our book. And one of them said that um, it was the equivalent of beer and pizza. And I thought, well, there's no problem with that. Everybody likes beer and everybody likes pizza, even if they claim they want something more sophisticated. So the result of that was that <laughs> I was mortified afterwards and I decided to go along and be a gentleman, which was a mistake. I should have been a lot more pugnacious. I wrote an introduction, which was far gentler than I wanted to be and far more inclusive. If I redid this book today, I would be far more aggressive and assertive. And I went then to one of my favorite pubs in London, the Star and Garden in Poland Street, and I drank seven pints of beer because, you know, it was a depressing experience. On the way down in the elevator after the interview, which I felt really deflated by, my publicist, Susie from ANC Black was with me and she was very supportive. 
One of the researchers, the people who really know about the books, they who find all the facts, the presenters, who aren't probably aren't as well read as they claim to be, said to me, well, I thought it sounded really interesting. I had been in touch with all my friends saying, please listen to um, this on, you know, open book. You know, it's a big opportunity for me. I hope you enjoy it. And then I wanted to sort of ring them and email them all and say, don't do it. And, you know, Christopher Priest said, oh, don't worry, Steve, I've been there, what have you. And basically, when the program went out, <laughs> I was sort of petrified, but it had been edited by the editor. And I actually pretty much came out really well, um, simply because I think the editorial team could see that the discussion was so one-sided. Also, during the interview, whenever I mentioned authors who were unfamiliar, like James Salter or M. John Harrison, they were pushed aside. Um, you know, there was none of this, oh, you know, who are they, what have you, because that was the thing. I don't think the presenters knew who they were, and nobody knows everything about books, of course. They were also edited out of the program, which I thought was quite interesting. The familiar names were kept in, so there you go. But it wasn't so bad, and then it was broadcast again a few days later. What happened in the meantime was the print run, which I think was 3,000 copies, sold out straight away and it went into reprint. You could see in the Amazon sales ranking, the book did really well. It was in the top 20,000 and it crept right the way up and was doing really well. And it was great. And of course you couldn't get anywhere because everybody would ordered it after the thing. And obviously that made you feel good because basically you could see the people wanted to make their mind up for themselves. And that was a really important thing. So that was heartening. The Guardian did a review, but unfortunately, Book Cement contains loads and loads of typos. Because you go through this process with a book where you write, write it, you send the manuscript off, it's corrected, it comes back to you, you re-correct it. And in that process, sometimes the re-corrections are done, but new errors creep in. And there's a point where it stops going back and forth. Uh, so the book had quite a few typos in it, including one which is a misspelling of Brett in Brett Easton Ellis. And The Guardian, predictably, because this was a book on books for men, hated it. And, you know, they made some trenchant points about, you know, how it was patronising and what have you. And, and, you know, how much there's too much reliance on sort of lowbrow stuff. When actually there were plenty of literary authors in here, like James Salter, who they ignored. So there you go. The main thing was that the book sold as a result. So there's a proof that there was no such thing as bad publicity. It was a solitary experience for me. So I knew that if I ever did anything like that again, I would go in, you know, with knives ready if I had to have them ready. Sadly, the book never really found this audience in the way I wanted it to. And it's a great shame because I, I do think we did some groundbreaking work in this and there's never been anything remotely like it since. So I've decided to resurrect it a bit and to talk about some of the books in here because one, I want to talk about mainstream literature more on the channel and to encourage those of you who read genre fiction to read more general fiction because there's plenty of general fiction out there which is exciting, concept-based, unique, stylish, that is readable for anybody who likes good quality literary genre fiction. Because of course on this channel we have a big focus on literary SF and things like that. So there's lots of things in here you'd enjoy even if you're here just for the SF content. So I would say do, in, do sort of try and read some of the books which I, which I mentioned in this and I'll talk about. Another reason why I want to do this is because I feel in, the, in a time like this where we're all told what to think, we're all told what to say, and people are afraid to say what they really think. It is important to stand up and talk about, you know, the truth about diversity and exclusion and difference and all these things. I strongly feel that 50% of the population of the world is often excluded from literary discussions an awful lot by an industry which, in my experience, is overly dominated by feminine voices. This doesn't mean I'm a misogynist. It doesn't mean anything like that at all. What it means is that we're talking about balance. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about inclusion via exclusivity. Let men write about what they want to write about. Let them read what they want to read. The first must-read book for men that I'm going to talk about is Hubert Selby Jr.'s The Demon. Hubert Selby Jr. is better known for this book, Last Exit to Brooklyn. This is the post-trial edition, complete and unexpurgated, with an introduction by Anthony Burgess. There was a big trial about this back in the 60s, which you can read about in this book, The Garden of Eros by John Calder, which is a wonderful book about avant-garde small press publishing. Um, and it's important for anybody who likes modernist or experimental writing or underground writing of any kind to get a really good historical perspective. It's a fantastic book. I've mentioned it several times here. Initially, the publishers lost um, and they appealed 
and I think it was on the second appeal that they won the case. So this edition was put together um, post-trial, so it's a first this. I bought this new, it was still available in the late 80s, and I'll just show you, when I met Anthony Burgess, um, I got him to sign some book plates for me, and so I've got Burgess' signature there, because he does the introduction of this edition, and also the signature of John Calder, the publisher from Calder and Byers. Um, I knew John because he used to actually sell his own books um, at a certain stage by the 80s and 90s. He was repping his own stuff, which was, you know, sad that somebody of that stature had to be his own sales team, but that was also, also part of his integrity. There is a famous film of this which came out in the 80s and it's an amazingly good novel. However, it's not my favourite novel by Selby Jr. so I'm not going to talk about it. Instead, I'm going to talk about The Demon. But before I do that, here's another very fine novel by Selby Jr. Requiem for a Dream, which was also made into a film more recently. This, as you see, has an endorsement by Lou Reed. If you read this, be careful. <laughs> if Lou Reed is telling you to be careful, then you really need to pay attention. So that's another great one to check out. But as I say, I want to move on to The Demon because I feel this is best book and is most underrated. This is my Boyaz edition of The Demon which I've had for many years. I think I bought at the end of the 80s, maybe early 90s. It was still imprinted in hardcover. It's a Penguin modern classic these days, and sadly little stock, little read. But in my opinion, it's a very, very important book. And I'm gonna do a reading from 100 Must Read Books of Men to explain why. Hubert Selby, 1928 to 2004, USA. The Demon, 1976. Before American Psycho and before Fight Club, there was the demon. Harry White is possessed by overwhelming animal urges. A thrusting young executive, he is a restless sexual predator spending his lunch hours stalking women for carnal conquest. As Harry's career star ascends, he experiences the odd wobble when his insatiable lust overcomes his ambition, putting his working future in jeopardy. Marrying the adorable Linda, who touches something in him no other woman has reached, Harry is made vice president of the firm, and the perfect couple purchase a cottage, a fitting home for their baby son, white picket fence and all. Despite this outward success, Harry's hidden genital gluttony combines with the pressures of work to threaten his sanity. Some kind of devil lurks inside him, eager to overpower its host. Madness beckons Harry, and with his license to lose control, the possibility of violence may cease to be a mere threat. Experiencing the demon is more like succumbing to severe delirium than reading. The reader inhabits Harry's feverish consciousness, assuming the mantle of a man driven by his id, the subconscious dark side of the personality that is usually concealed even from its owner. A searing assault on the stifling nature of conformity, exposing the hypocrisy behind the genteel image of so many responsible family men, the demon also argues powerfully for society to understand the demands of contemporary lifestyles that clash so contrastingly with the flight or fight body chemistry we inherited from our ancestors. Aside from his genius at expressing the interior agonies of a man bullied by his own testosterone, making the book an essential read for women wanting to understand their partners, Salby's compassion shines throughout the demon, just as it did in Last Exit to Brooklyn, his most famous book. As the subject of a notorious obscenity case, Last Exit, despite its brilliance, has unfairly overshadowed Salby's other work. One of America's finest avant-garde writers, sometime heroin addict, Salby was ahead of his time and quietly influential, remaining undiscovered by many readers who would worship his bleak yet tender oeuvre. The Demon is, in my view, his most underrated book, a masterpiece that deserves the widest possible recognition. Appended to this, I also recommended Requiem for a Dream as a second choice. And to read on from this, novels such as Paul Bowles' Let It Come Down, William Burris Jr.'s Kentucky Ham, a fantastic autobiographical novel. Burris Jr., of course, the son of William S. Burris Sr., and he was also friendly with Philip K. Dick. I also recommended John Fante's Ask the Dust and Herbert Hank's The Evening Sun Turned Crimson, which is non-fiction, but it's written like a novel. Herbert Hank is Herman from Junkie by William S. Burroughs. So that's The Demon. Do seek it out. It's an amazing novel. Um, I think it'll resonate with, with all men who've ever had to struggle with, um, with their body chemistry and their consciousness. 
and I think it's very compassionate and tender and also very brilliantly violently written um, and it's a wonderful wonderful novel and very powerful and as I say I don't think there would have been American Psycho um, or Fight Club without it. This is Steve Neandrews, Outlaw Bookseller, signing out with 100 Must Read Books for Men. Bye for now.